Oh my gosh, I'm doing a TED Talk. <laughs> So I was actually backstage doing my two-minute power stance. Have you guys seen that one? OK, I'm lying. It was 20 seconds, but I still did it. So let's see if this works. So just give me a minute, because I just want to look at you. So you, you guys are so beautiful, so beautiful. How many of you guys actually believed that when I said it? <laughs> oh, nice. I'm really, I'm really stoked that actually believe me. So for the rest of you, how many of you thought, yeah, but, you know, like, yeah, but my thighs, or <laughs> yeah, but my hair, yeah, but my gut. What about yeah, but my butt, right? <laughs> so um, I know that a lot of you could come up with those yeah, buts, but I'm, I know that we also have a hard time considering that we actually are genuinely beautiful. You see, I have this theory that because we are used to being bombarded with these messages of what we're not, then it almost becomes normal for us to be um, unhappy with who we actually are, right? I think we believe that we would be perfect and you know, enormously attractive if only we could make that bigger, uh, maybe make that a little bit smaller, tuck that under, right? Make that a little lighter, relax that curl, or change that color. But the truth is, you are beautiful. And my hope is that by the end of this conversation, you will question why you ever even doubted your beauty. I also hope that you will join me in challenging the standard of beauty. And I hope you do that by creating counter narratives that, that are around who and what is beautiful. You see, I, have, um, I aspire to live in a tomorrow where we recognize that there is no standard of beauty, but in fact, there's diversity in beauty, where no one type of person kind of holds the monopoly on what is beautiful, where the structures um, and the industries that perpetuate and create and reinforce the ideas of, beauties, of beauty will actually celebrate diversity over homogeny. Lastly, though, I really want to live in a tomorrow where you and I aren't seeking the permission of or we're, we're asking for an approval from the standard of beauty to actually love ourselves. Thank you. And I really want you to know that this is so very doable. It's so doable. Um, so, I believe that the standard of beauty is actually simply a cultural construct. This simply means to me that it's a collection of ideas and thoughts around physical appearance that each generation and each, gener and each culture comes up with and then reinforces it through its music, its art, its media, and even its politics. You see, it's us, we're the culture. We're the one who decides who is beautiful and what is beautiful down to like the littlest thing like shoe size, right? So I would like to suggest that even forming a standard of beauty um, and expecting everyone to kind of live up to that, it does us a disservice because we're creating unreal, an unrealistic and superficial hierarchy of beauty. And I think it's also problematic because it often marginalizes, it alienates, it dismisses, and it often makes invisible entire communities of people. And I think that this is completely unacceptable. So I remember when I was a little girl, maybe about six or seven, I really, really wanted to be beautiful, or I called it pretty back then, right? <laughs> I remember knowing that being a beautiful woman was so important. I knew it was an essential part of being a woman, and I knew that it was a type of currency that I could use to kind of navigate through the world. I figured out early on that beautiful women received praise, approval, acceptance, and free stuff. <laughs> and... <laughs> And I really wanted free stuff. <laughs> um, 
So in my little mind, though, there were three things that were really important to me. These were the three things that would make me so very beautiful, right? So the first one was fair skin. And I'm hoping my fair skin. And not any kind of fair skin, but Disney fair skin, right? <laughs> you know the kind of fair skin that lets you walk through the enchanted forest and sing to woodland creatures? <laughs> that was the kind of fair skin that I wanted. <laughs> In other words, I wanted to be white, right? Um, the second thing that was really, really important to me was having light eyes, so maybe blue or hazel. And I don't know why, I thought, maybe I thought it was exotic or it gave me deep meaning, but what the heck does a six-year-old know about deep meaning or being exotic, right? But of the, of the three, the most important one was long, flowing, preferably blonde hair, right? <laughs> long, you know, and not, and not just any kind of long, flowing, blonde hair, the kind that even if I'm in a room where there's no windows, <laughs> it just goes, right? <laughs> and it makes you like walk in slow motion, <laughs> and everybody stops and stares at you, yeah. How realistic was that? Because this is how I really look. <laughs> and there's a part of me that looks at these pictures of myself, and I really do feel sad for the young me. I mean, it actually kind of breaks my heart that I, you know, I, I was struggling with this idea of who I really was and the image that I actually had come up with in my mind. Um, so it took me a really, really long time to come to the place where this was sufficient, right? So now I stand before you with my brown skin, and I love it, right? <laughs> I have these really deep, dark brown eyes. If they're mysterious or not, who cares, right? <laughs> And most of all, I have this, like, wind-defying hair. <laughs> I almost dare a gale force wind to, to try, right? <laughs> but my ideas of beauty, um, they weren't a conscious, you know, it wasn't a conscious choice. It was based on the construct and the narrative around beauty that I, I learned as a little girl. So the images that I was bombarded with um, taught me that I wasn't the standard. I even remember one year telling my mom for Christmas that I wanted a doll, but this doll had to be white, right? Because white dolls were pretty dolls. Now, how does a six-year-old little black girl decide that white dolls are the pretty dolls? So I would, think, I would say that a lot of it had to do with the commercials I saw in between the cartoons that I watched, right? I almost never saw black dolls being represented in these commercials. Well, maybe I would see the black version of the white doll at the end of the commercial, but I never saw black girls in the commercial, and I never saw the black, um, the black dolls in the commercial. So I was invisible, right? I didn't see anybody that looked like me. So the, the narrative that I learned as a little girl about the standard of beauty is, I would say, is one that I see perpetuated today. And the narrative goes something like this. A beautiful woman is or has Eurocentric features, you know, like a long, skinny nose. She has fair skin. Um, she has long, preferably blonde hair. She has light eyes. She's skinny and has a feminine frame. She has long legs. <laughs> Um, she's also cisgendered, right? She's abled body and she's heterosexual. You know, perfect, right? And I think many of you would agree with me in saying that this standard of beauty is the one that's uh, most often per perpetrated or perpetuated. Um, and what's interesting is that I searched beautiful woman just on Google, and this is what I got. I then searched beautiful woman and almost got the same exact thing. 
There were a couple Beyonce's, and there were a couple pictures of the First Lady, but for the most part, this was the image that I, I saw. And actually, one of the producers asked his friend, who lives in Atlanta, Georgia, he's a male, he's African-American, um, he lives in the hub of black culture, to do the same search so we can see if maybe we would get something different from Portland. He got the same exact image. So I think it would be really interesting to have people do this search around the world and see what they would come up with. I'd be really interested in the results. Um, so my biggest fear is that this idea um, perpetuates homogeny. And this standard tells little girls who look like me, your skin, it's too black. Your nose, it's too wide. Your hair, it's too curly. You know, It tells them that their shape is too round. So if it tells me and little black girls this, what does it tell our disabled girls? What does it tell our full-figured girls? What does it tell our transgendered girls? You see, I think when we choose not to acknowledge the diversity of beauty or the other forms of beauty that exist in the world, there are real-life consequences for those who don't meet those standards, and for all of us, right? I think it's natural to want to be beautiful, right? I think it's in our genes to want to, to be beautiful. Um, and I think it's normal to want to feel beautiful. I want to feel beautiful. But we are more than the sum of our genes. We are beings of consciousness. We're critical thinkers. We're self-aware. And we have choice. Therefore, I think that we get to decide what makes us feel beautiful. And in fact, I think that we get to decide if we even want to live up to the idea of being beautiful. Um, I don't think we owe being beautiful to anyone or being pretty to anyone. Yeah. So I want to read you this quote from Erin McKean. And I, every, when I first saw this quote, I was like, yes! And it gives me life every single time. And I thought I would just share it with you. She says, you don't have to be pretty. You don't owe prettiness to anyone, not your boyfriend, not your spouse, not your partner, not your coworkers, especially not random men on the street. <laughs> right? Right. You don't owe it to your mother. You don't owe it to your children. You don't even owe it to civilization in general. Prettiness is not the rent you pay for ocu occupying the space marked female. Right? Ah. I just need a moment, because it's so, just so good. It's so good. <laughs> so, but I think what's really hard is that we're rarely given the permission by our culture and even by ourselves to be anything other than the standard or the ideal, right? To be our own beautiful. But it can be done, and it has been done, and I am so excited to share with you what black women have done for themselves. Black women are a great example of a group who decided that our own beautiful was sufficient. <laughs> right? High five. <laughs> black women have changed our minds about how we feel about our hair. And using social media, we have told the world, right? We've decided that we're going to love our hair and we're going to wear it the way it grows out of our head. <laughs> and, and we call this the natural hair movement. And though it doesn't really seem like a big deal for us, this is a huge deal. I mean, this is, this is like epic for us. Um, because you see, for most of the 20th century, black women have told, I would say 19th, maybe 17th, 19th, 20th, all of them, all of the centuries, right? <laughs> <laughs> we, have been, we have been conditioned to believe that straight hair equals beautiful hair. And we have, been, we have been conditioned to believe that our curls, our kinks, our waves, our texture need to be tamed. Black women have been taught that our hair is kinky, it's nappy, it's unattractive, it's hard to do, it's wild, it's crazy, it's unprofessional, it's unmanageable, it's, un, it's unpresentable. And the list goes on and on. And there's almost, there's very few adjectives that are positive around our hair in its unprocessed way, in, our, in its unprocessed version. 
So I would say that most people found the Afro beautiful, but for the most part, um, it was considered militant. Um, so we, black women, have gone through so many products and so many lengths to get rid of our natu natural curls. We've made so many people rich in the process of doing so. <laughs> but something happened at the right time. Black women, we started asking ourselves a couple questions. Why am I putting these dangerous chemicals on my hair? Why do I feel the need to even straighten my hair? Why do I believe that my texture is bad? And in the age of the internet, internet, we started forming online communities around our hair to support one another, to teach one another, to discuss product use, right? We teach each other on YouTube tutor tutorials, and we have like all, all kinds of stuff on Pinterest. Go on there, you'll see. We even started making, um, we even started opening salons that cater specifically to natural hair care, right? And we started making dolls that have natural hair so that our daughters will have something that represents them. <laughs> Quite amazing, right? right? And I also want to add, we have challenged legislation and changed laws around natural hair care in multiple states. So all I want to say is that I'm really proud of us for what we've done. But what we, I would say that the things that we have done have actually flipped the hair industry upside down. So companies that used to make products specifically and only for straightening our hair have seen decrease in profits, and so now they've had to create products that cater to those of us with natural hair. This is black women no longer asking for permission to love themselves. This is black women loving our own kind of beautiful. This is proof that it's possible to change the standard. So with that said, how do you then believe in your own beauty? So I think there's a couple things you can do. One, you can acknowledge that there is a standard, but you can also recognize that you have the, you have the power to change that standard. I'm going to say you can question everything about beauty because most of it is a lie. I think it's really important to be mindful about your inner dialogue and take account of the negative thoughts and the language that you rehearse about yourself. But I think it's important not to stop there. I think that you really have to um, replace those thoughts with positive, with positive thoughts about yourself. I think that you have to stop holding others, as well as yourself, um, to this standard or this idea. Um, I think that instead you have to create positive counter-narratives like the natural hair movement um, for yourself. And I say practice it until you believe it. Don't fake it till you make it. Practice it until you believe it. And I really think that you need to su surround yourself with like-minded people and people that genuinely love you as you are with your own kind of beauty. You see, it's only by deconstructing these unrealistic ideas and expectation of perfection that we actually can be free to love ourselves. So before I leave, there are a couple things that I want to remind you. One, you are beautiful. You really are, right? Your beauty. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I want you to know that your beauty is valid. And I, want you to, and I want you to know that your beauty, the one that you choose for yourself, is sufficient. You see, I believe wholeheartedly that you are the only person in all of the universe, in all of time and space, that will get to be you. You are the only one that has that opportunity. So, if you don't live your life as yourself and love yourself as yourself, who's going to get to do that, right? So I'm asking you to really think about what that really means. And remember, you have choice. You have the choice to be your own beauty, to be your own beautiful. So I'm challenging you to choose wisely and how you will love yourself. Yeah.